Okay, Erev Tov, good evening and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me and everybody else. Um, we are going to do, as I said in the group today, uh, I'm going to finish up talking about Rabbi Yochanan Zakai. I owe you a story, uh, some of the things he did, uh, more than what we saw last week. We're going to talk about a period of time that comes a little after that, which is the Bar Kochla revolution, uh, revolt rather, uh, and, and some other things and see how they actually still to this day affect some of what we do. Uh, so I want to I want to just mention very briefly some of the character traits that Rabbi Yochum and Zakai had um, that he was known for <clears throat> because it's important to understand who this man was more than just what he did. Uh, he was evidently a person who was very mild-mannered, very casual speaker. Uh, he was always wearing tefillin whenever there was... <clears throat> a class, whenever there was davening, but something happening, he was the first one in, last one out. He was very punctual about his time. Um, he was a, a person who valued Torah. He valued community. And he valued Judaism among all, among everything, above everything. And therefore, it's what propelled him to do certain actions that we have till today have benefited. The story that, I, that I'm going to tell you is in the Gemara. It's mentioned actually in at least four sources with some changes. There's multiple, not giant differences, but some differences between the way the story is told. I'm going to tell you the way the Gemara approaches the story because it's important to us to understand what's happening right now, just going back just before the Chorban, just before the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Remember talking the second Beit HaMikdash? So the year is just before the year 70, before the actual destruction of Beit HaMikdash. <clears throat> Vespasian uh, it has uh, from Rome is his people, his his garrisons, his armies are in the land of Israel, and Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai can see the writing on the wall. He can see that the the noose is tightening around Jerusalem. And he comes up with this plan that he wants to go to discuss with Vespasian. He wants to get out of the city of Jerusalem, which is under siege, uh, to talk to him to see what he can do. So he says, look, there's no no people going in and out of the city. The only people that are allowed to be let out of the city are those who were dead and they were in a coffin. So he hatched this plan to have put himself, have himself put into a coffin, brought outside the city, and then he would go to the Roman governor to go to Vespasian. Problem was that the city had a lot of what are called Biryonin. Modern day Hebrew, it means bullies. But they were the zealots who were the people who like we're going to do anything we can. We, you know, we got to kill the, 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 the I would say the British because now I'm jumping forward to 1917, but we got to do everything we do against the Romans. We shouldn't bend to them. We shouldn't anything. We're not going to allow, they burned their own storehouses down. It was, it was a mess. So Yochem and Zakai is, he, he hatches this plan. He's about to go out of the city and these Biryonim, these bullies, these zealots stop the coffin. And they say to the person, to the people carrying it, we're going to take a sword and we're going to pierce it just to make sure He's actually dead. And they said, what are you doing? It's crazy because the Romans are going to say that you defile the bodies of our great sages. They said, okay, fine. What we're going to do, we're going to take the, the coffin and we're going to move it around and see if he yells at all or he, he goes, ouch. They said, again, they said that it, it's impossible because, again, the Romans who are just outside the gate are going to see this. They're going to think that this is how we treat our sages. You can't do that. So finally, these, these zealots relent. And the gates open up to let Rabbi Yochum ben Zakkai out, uh, ostensibly his body. He gets outside the city, uh, outside Jerusalem, and he pops out of his, his uh, coffin, and he goes running to Vespasian. At this point, Vespasian, Vespasian is not yet the king slash emperor of Rome. And he goes to him and says, Shalom Aleichem HaMelech, like, how you doing, king? So Vespasian says, you are deserving of two death penalties for that statement. He says, what are you talking about? He said, well, first of all, you call me king, and I'm not a king. So you can't, you're, that means you're already, you're already poking the eye of the real king. And number two, if I am the king, why didn't you come to me before? I'm the king, you should have shown me the, the, the respect. So Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai gives him two answers. He said, number one, it's not that you are a king right now, but you are about to become the king. I know that because we know that Jerusalem seems to be in the verge of falling. And our Nevi'im, our prophets, tell us Jerusalem's going to fall to a king. 
And secondly, why I have not come before you today until today is he explains to them the whole thing of the zealots in the city and the people that are preventing him from leaving. While they're talking, a messenger comes from Rome and said that the emperor died and they've, the Senate has appointed um, Vespasian as the new king emperor. And now all of a sudden Vespasian's eyes light up like, wow, this is like this guy came to me, this Jew. Yeah, he's a sage and all, but he's, he's a Jew. And he just told me about the becoming king. And all of a sudden, poof, I'm the king. So he says, I'll tell you what, Vespasian agrees. Because, because obviously the reason that, that Rabbi Yochan ben Zakai comes to the king is he wants something. He says, I'm going to grant you, literally grant you three wishes. I'll grant you three things. Number one. He says, I, he says, I agree, I, will, I want to ask for three things. The first thing he says is, I want the Romans to guarantee the safety of all the, the um, scholars of Yavna. We're going to see what that means in a minute. That's the one I'm going to come back to. The second one is that I want to guarantee the survival of a specific family. It's the family of Rabban Gamliel. Rabban Gamliel, whose name you are maybe familiar with. The reason he wanted to ensure that no matter what happens, he knew that there was disaster coming, but he wanted to ensure that Megamil's family survived is that he was a direct descendant of David Melech. And in order to perpetuate the Davidic dynasty, the kingdom of David, the next king will be, the Mashiach will be a descendant of David, we couldn't end this family line. And the third request he had was that he wanted to allow the Roman doctors to treat um, Rabbi Tzadok. Rabbi Tzadok was a man who fasted for 40 years during the day for the purpose of trying to beseech God to save Jerusalem. So he had three things he asked for him. But the way he phrased the, the first one was a little different than I said. He said the following, let's put it on the screen because it's a famous line and it is very much important to understand where we go from here. He said, Tainli Yavne the Chachameha. Give me Yavne and its uh, wise men, its Chachamim. So first of all, let's ask ourselves a question. And the Gemara discusses it. Here he has the ear of the king. He's able to ask for anything. He says, I, you know, I'll give you three wishes or three three requests. I'm making a light of it, but three three requests. Why does he ask for Yavne? Why doesn't he just say, don't destroy Jerusalem? I mean, that would have been a better thing. If, if we saw last week that the whole Mahut, the characteristic of Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai was to perpetuate Judaism, wouldn't it have been a better solution to tell him, like, back off and don't destroy Jerusalem? So the Gemara answers that he understood. He was he was very wise politically. And he understood there was no way that, that that request was going to be granted. And he didn't want to waste, in quotes, a request like that. And he decides to go for a different, a different approach. In the same time period, there were many wise individuals, many sages, Chachamim, living already in Yavne. There was already a hub of Torah in, in Yavne. And he understood that that would be potentially a place that he could rejuvenate. I don't want to say recreate because it wasn't gone, but to rejuvenate Judaism as Jerusalem was about to fall. So he makes this plea for Ten Yavne the Chachamim. There are opinions, and opinion at least in the Gemara, that what he did was wrong. He should have asked. Even he could have been turned down. But he, he said, his expression in modern, in kvar, as kvar. if already you're asking, you know, or go big or go home. But he didn't. So he is called the task, according to some. But most look at him still being a tremendous hero. And what he did was to ask for Yavne. And again, the reason why Yavne asked this question last week, it didn't have to do with its physical location. It had to do with the fact that it was already a hub of learning. There already were chachamim there. Okay, so there are a couple more, a few more things just briefly I want to mention about Rebbe Hamed Zafai before we move on. Um, one has to do with the topic, let's go about here. Now, this is his end of his life. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to talk about the concept of Shul Beta Knesset in this time period. I've, I've had this question over the years. It's come up, not in the history class, but in general, we've talked in our TLA class and in other um, situations, like where did the Shul come from? First of all, what does the word mean in English? It's not English. The word shul is from German shul, which means school. The the um, the synagogue, which is called in English, comes from the Greek synagogue, 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 um, which means to bring together, which really fits in with the word beta knesset. Uh, like, for example, when Esther Amalka says 
to Mordechai, she says, Lech you be gather all the people together. Or you have a, a kennis, because it's a kennis is a conference, but it means people gather together for a purpose. So Beit Knesset at that time period wasn't necessarily, it's a little before the end of Second Temple being destroyed. They're already, even not more than a, a little while before that, they already have a, a, what we would call Beit Knesset, but not necessarily in the same idea of what it is today. It was more for a gathering place, whether it's to learn Torah, some um, impromptu prayers, but the institution of prayer, and specifically Shemona Esri, has yet to be invented. That's going to be coming up. I'm going to deal with that. Um, and, <clears throat> well, I'm kind of going a little out of order. Let's put Shemona Esri aside. Not, not for now. Um, but in the, the time, so what one of the things Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai does is he wants to have a replication of the Beit HaMikdash as it's been destroyed. So we know that we have an Aram Kodesh in a show where you have the Torah. We know that in front of it is the Parochet, is the curtain. That's supposed to be symbolic of what it was like in the Beit HaMikdash. You had the Kodesh Kodashim, the Holy of Holies. There was a Parochet, there was a, a curtain, actually two, in front of it as a, as a, a sign of respect, cover, a whole bunch of other reasons. The, um, the purpose eventually became to replant the worship that was done in the Beit HaMikdash into the Beit into the Batek Knesset, it also earned, the shul also earned the title uh, Mikdash Me'at, the minor Beit HaMikdash. Why? Again, because it was to, as the Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai wanted to do, was to perpetuate a place for Jews to congregate, to daven, to come together for more than just prayer, but to for purposes of, of community. Um, it also was for Idud, for uh, encouraging. Because remember, we talked about, imagine the destruction being present and seeing the destruction of Beit HaMikdash and the horrible things that that would have given someone to maybe think that it's over. Um, now, before we look at that next stage of, um, of the, of just happens a few years later, let's go back to one more thing about Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, and then we'll close the chapter on him for now. Rabbi Yohan and Zakkai got sick, and while he's lying on his deathbed, his students come to him. It's a very well-known Gemara, only because it has a tremendous, you'll sometimes hear this Gemara quoted by speakers, rabbis, especially in Elul and Rosh Hashanah time, Kippur, because of the message. It says as follows, Amrullah. So the kid, the students come in while he's lying on his deathbed, and the students say to him, Rabbeinu Baruchin, Rabbi, our teacher, give us a bracha. Now, here's the, the great Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who we say is credited with saving Judaism. Marlehem, he says to them, Iratzon, it should be your will, his will. Shetei mora shamayim alechem, mora basar vada. It means, he's, in English, that means, may it be God's will, that the fear of heaven be upon you, my students, like the fear of man. Amrulo told me that. So students said, Ad Khan, that's it? That's the big bracha you're going to get us, that we should have Irat shamayim? We should fear in awe of heaven. If only that would be. What does he mean? He continues. He says to the students, you should know. When a person's about to do a sin, he says, I hope nobody sees me. They don't think, oh, maybe a human being is going to see me. Yes, but they're afraid of that. <laughs> Sorry. They don't say, oh, Maybe God will see me. He says, if only you would be afraid of Hashem, the same level you're afraid of other people. He says, and this is the message that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai leaves the people with. So on the one hand, he's, he he reestablishes, and we talked about the Takanot, the various uh, edicts he made uh, um, as far as the Zechel Mikdash, the remembrance of the Beit HaMikdash. We talked about the Beit HaKnesset. We talked about the whole idea of, of trying to rebuild from literally from the ashes of the Beit HaMikdash. And he ends his, his life with this very poignant message to us that it's not enough to serve Hashem with our mouths and with our bodies, just like to go through the motions. He's, he's, he's given us a lot of framework, but it also has to be something that we have inside of us. We also have to have this, this concept, this recognition of Shiviti Hashem and Aditami, that the set that understand that Hashem is before us at all times. Let's move into the next section that I want to talk about. Uh, and that is the Bar Kokhba revolt. 
Rabbi Yochanan ben, ben Zakkai died in the year 90. So he dies 20 years after the destruction of Eitan Mikdash. But in order to understand this idea of the Bar Kokhba revolt, we're going to need some background. There have been already two uprisings, two revolts against the Romans. The second one, both of the first two, both ended disaster. The second one, the disaster is the destruction of Eitan Mikdash. After the destruction of Eitan Mikdash, the Romans have now taken, effectively have taken, uh, occupying the country. And they are, they are not necessarily the nicest people, let's put it that way. So approximately the year 132. So we're talking about 40 years less, about 40 years after Rabbi Yochanan Zakai passes away. There's a one more push, one more stand for the B'nai Israel, for the Jewish people against the Romans. Along comes a man named Rabbi, a man named um, Bar Kochva. Bar Kochva was Shimon Bar Kochva. He's just known as Bar Kochva, uh, the son of the star. We'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, and he begins a revolt against the Romans. He's It lasts for a few years, and it's actually very successful. Um, it was the, like I said, the third of the, now, it, I have not, I don't think, mentioned the name of, um, no, Josephus. Maybe I mentioned him last week. We'll, we'll hear more about him at another time. But, um, but Josephus has a book of many, one called The War of the Jews, which has to do with this time period. Um, but this is the third Jewish war, Roman war. And in the beginning, it's pretty successful. He actually is able to establish an independent area where the Jews have now taken, I'll use the word sovereignty in quotes, in the area of Beta. For those of you who know where Beta is, the Beta elite, I'm not talking about the basketball or soccer, I don't know which one it is, um, but that's where the name comes from. And he establishes himself as the kind of like the governor, and he's he's looked at in a sense in a very interesting perspective. What's that perspective? The perspective is that he's looked at as almost being a Mashiach. Now, remember, I mentioned to you last week that the destruction of Beitani Dash, on the one hand, was a, a horrific event, but on the other hand, it also started giving rise to this concept of messianism, of the idea of Mashiach. And a Messiah coming to, because how bad how, can't get any worse than a Beit Hamikdash being destroyed? And I said that this week we'd see the result of that. So this is one of the first times we're going to see that result come through. We're going to see it multiple times over the next time of the years of learning. But uh, it's so in um, unfortunately in the in one thirty five. So it's only lasts a couple of years. Beit which is the, the 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 symbol of success in this short in the short run. Not only is Bar Kochva killed, but many Jewish rebels who fought with him are executed and are, are executed or they're, they're enslaved during this course of this next year. It doesn't happen overnight, but in a period of time. Um, the Romans, and we're going to come back to Betar in a few minutes because it's a very critical piece of, of uh, history that to this very day actually plays a part in something we do. Um, the rule of the Romans, let's go back just a little bit, the rule, the rule of the Romans in Judea in general uh, was not very well received uh, by the Jewish people. And for the time period, like what brought about this rebellion? How come all of a sudden Bar Kokhba decides to kind of like jump out and do this? So we have to understand why. Um, the Romans didn't just run the country. They didn't just live here. They did a few things that were pretty bad. Uh, first of all, they did some. They, they affected the administrative and economic life of the Jews, uh, whether it was taxes or having, having certain institutions that had to be run through the, through the Roman government. They established what the colony was called Aelia Capitolina. Aelia Capitolina is was uh, was named in honor of Jupiter uh, Jupiter Capitolina, their, their god Jupiter. It's not just the name of a planet, um, and it was meant to be on the Temple Mount. They made a they built a monument for worship of Jupiter. Now think about that. The Jews were talking about now not only witness destruction of Beit HaMikdash, they saw on the mount, the Temple Mount, where the Beit HaMikdash stood, that the Romans put an idol or something in order, it was the idol of Jupiter, that was to be worshipped on the Temple Mount. Comes along this charismatic man, every one of the false messiahs that we will talk about, whether it's whether it is um, 
um, Yaakov Frank, or it's uh, Shabtai Tzvi, or others, every one of them um, was a very charismatic character. And if you don't know those names, that's fine. We will eventually get to talk about them. And uh, to, to such an extent that Rabbi Akiva, who we'll also talk about shortly, Rabbi Akiva felt Bar Kochva himself was the Mashiach. He, 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 the Gemara Gitan tells us this. So initially, the, the rebels, as I said, are victorious. They're gaining ground. They have a provisional state, so to speak, and using modern terms in Beitar. Um, this is a setback for the Romans. You think about it here. By the way, you think about the Roman The Roman Empire was massive. I'm not going to put a map on the screen now. But you know the, the pictures that you've seen, I'm sure, on Facebook and other places that show the current Middle East. They have in green all the Arab countries and a little teeny dot of red where Israel is. That was nothing compared to the Roman Empire. It was much larger than that. And so what we're talking about Judea to us, which is it's our Jewish history, it's our base, it's our background, it's everything. To them, it was just a fly on the wall. It was just another province that they had rule over. But nevertheless, it was still their land. They, they still looked at it as their, their, their baby. And it, this this idea of this revolt was a tremendous setback for them, obviously. And it's because of that that Hadrian, who's in charge at this point, um, crushes the revolt. Crushes the revolt, kills Bokhova, as I said, uh, and disastrous results for the Jewish people. There's archaeological evidence that the area of Betar and around there was depopulated. That's a very, very clean, pristine word. What does it mean, depopulated of Jews? So that you know, the in, in Nazi Germany, they had the term Judenrein. Judenrein meant Jew free, right? Free. You'll notice as we go through Jewish history, there is nothing new under the sun. Whether it's Judenrein, free, free Palestine or the, the depopulation of Betar, it's always been the same with our enemies. But again, as I said before, that many were killed, executed. And by the way, this is the time period already of crucifixions, and they're being they're being not just killed, they're being, they're, they're being tortured, they're being crucified. But the Jews who are expelled, who are sent into the exile, the diaspora, while they're being sold as slaves or sent into slavery, we're going to see shortly, that it actually turns out to be a good thing. How do you say oh, the Jews are slaves? You know, how could that be something good? We'll see. Hang on to that. While this is playing out, the center for the Jewish life and society is now moved to shift it from the area of Judea up north to the Galil, to the Galilee. Um, at this point, the Romans say, you know what? We're not too happy with these Jews, and we really need to make sure we come down with them with a strong fist. And they actually barred Jews from coming into Yerushalayim. For those of you who have been in the old city and you've gone through the Cardo, you know that the Cardo was a market, an open market at this time period. No Jews ever walked in the Cardo. Never. Well, now they do. I'm saying back then it was an actual market. No, no Jews went because Jews were barred from there. But after Hadrian dies, the Romans kind of said, okay, we're going to pull the reins in just a little bit. We're going to open the doors a little. And they decide to allow the Jews to enter Jerusalem one day a year. And what day do you think that is? Tisha B'Av. Why? Why Tisha B'Av? Well, they know their history. The first temple destroyed Tisha B'Av. Second temple destroyed Tisha B'Av. And good morning, Betar fell on Tisha B'Av. We will see multiple things. The Jews are exiled from Spain on Tisha B'Av. First World War begins on Tisha B'Av. So many things in our history. The Jews are tossed out of, of, of England. and just, Every time we're expelled, something has to do with Tisha B'Av. In any case, Bar Kochur's uh, revolt also was had some philosophical, some religious ramifications. The, the idea of spirituality and the Shia, the Sai, the belief, um, starts to become more permeated into the literature now remember we're not yet at a point where we have books we don't even have a mishnah yet that's coming we do actually but this is but we're in the early stages we're coming up to it soon but there's no books yet there's still just a tanakh but it's starting in the teachings of the rabbis as we switch into what's called in this time period of history rabbinic judaism as we move towards another 50 years from now 
this starts to permeate because, okay, this he wasn't Mashiach, but the Rabbi Akiva thought he was, so there has to be this concept. We have to really work on that. Unfortunately, the Gemara refers to Bar Kochva. Now, why did he call, why was he called Bar Kochva? Because Rabbi Akiva attributed to him the Pasuk, Barach Kochav Miyakov. A star will come from Yaakov, meaning that was a reference in the Torah <laughs> to Mashiach. And he said, this is the son of the, this is Bar Kochva. He is the, the star, the, the rising star, literally and figuratively, to become our Mashiach. The Gemara, after the, uh, refers though to him as Bar Koziva. Um, means that our son of deception, because it was a it was used as a derogatory term, saying he was nothing more than a false prophet, a false Mashiach. That also, this is the early stages. We can't lose sight of the fact that we are not the only people on planet Earth. When I was growing, I've told this story before. When I was growing up, learning in school about Itziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus, and learning about all these things, I thought the Jews were the only people on Earth. I didn't know there was anybody else. You know, until you get a little bit older and realize there's more than just Jews in the world. Uh, this is the time, this is the early days of Christianity. And part of what fuels the beginning of Christianity is this idea of a Messiah, a Messiah, a Mashiach coming to, to save, to save the world. And it also, the rebel, this time period starts to split this, who's really more associated with the Christians and who's more associated with the Jews. Now, what does this have to do with us today. This is a good piece of history and everything else. But one of the things I'd like to try to bring across as we go through this is if there's any connection between this historical event and stuff that we go through today, it's good to show. So let me show you. Oops. Went too far. Gemara in Masakat Brachot on the right hand of the side of the screen. For, for terms of this, I will use the word benching, which is the colloquial term. Birkat Amazon, benching from the word bench, which is German for to a blessing. Um, where did it come from? So here's the Gemara tells us. Amar of Nachman, top of the right hand screen. I'll read it and translate. Amar of Nachman, Moshe Tikin Liso Birkat Hazan. The first bracha in of Birkat Hazan was established, was written by Moshe Rabbeinu when Bishashi Arad Lahem Man. Just a couple of weeks ago, we just read about the Man. Um, it's when it first came down, he wrote the first paragraph of Birkat Hazan. Yoshua. Joshua, Tikein Lehem Birkat Haaretz. The next bracha was, was established by Yehoshua. Kevan Shenich Nesul Haaretz. When they entered Israel, he wrote the second paragraph of Birkat HaMazol. David Ushlamo Tiknu Bonei Yerushalayim. David Ushlamo authored the bracha of Bonei Yerushalayim. David Tikein Alam Chai Yisrael. Ali Salamach Vay Yisrael Mirach. Ushlamo Tikein Alam Bayit HaGadol HaKadosh. So that section of the Birkat HaMazol was established by David Ushlamo. Now, Hatov V'Hameti. The next part, like the long paragraph, <clears throat> was established in Yavna. Now, keep in mind, this is already after destruction of the downfall of Betar. The, Yavna remains a hub of Judaism, a hub of teaching Torah. In Yavna, they established the word, the bracha, the part of the bracha, which is on the left side of the screen, we'll come to in a minute, Atov HaMetiv, Keneged Harugay Betar. Why did they write it? In honor of those who fell in Betar. Why? What was so special about that? Tamar of Matna. Matna tells us, What happened was, after the revolt and after the Romans come and they slaughter the Jews in Betar, they gave them one last final slap in the face. And that was they didn't allow the Jews to bury their dead. The bodies laid out for a long period of time. I can't tell you how long. I don't know. But they laid there for a very long time. And then finally, the edict was given, was given permission to the Jews to bury their dead. The day that the Jews were given over to be allowed to bury their dead, they established the bracha of Birkat Amazon, why? For two miracles. These bodies did not start to decompose and smell. The whole time they were lying there on the ground. And the Hametiv, and the Hamitiv part of the bracha was that they were given over for burial. So understand that when we say, look on the left side of the screen, it's a bracha that's beautiful about Hashem has always, always did and always will try to give us the good and the best. And that. Where's the source for it? Is the Hatova Hamitiv bracha, which is established in Yavna that we say in Birkat Amazon. It's a very important 
um, connection to what we're learning tonight. We're going to learn about one more person at this, two more people at this time period that also are, uh, the, the, the problem when you learn and teach history, you learn history, if you learn about every single person and every single event, you're never going to finish. You're never going to get to modern times. So it has to be like at the window down who we're going to learn about. But there are a couple of very important individuals who I try to focus on who are game changers. Rabbi Yochan and Zakai and Bar Kochva. Now we're going to hear for just a couple of minutes about a man named Yehuda ben Baba. You would have been Baba. Maybe none of you have heard him. Maybe some of you have. But some of you may realize after I finish talking about him that you actually know who he is. One of the, one of the um, edicts that was made by the Roman go governors was that the Jews were not allowed to confer smicha on another Jew. What was smicha? So nowadays, you know that I and many people have a title rabbi. In, the, in the time, this time period of history, well, what happened was a teacher would teach his students, much like today. And when he felt that he had the knowledge to be a moe ora'a, he was able to be a teacher and make and, and give psak halacha and decide halacha, he would give him what was called smicha. Why was it called smicha? Because it's called smicha. He would put his hands on the, on the person's head and give him the uh, a document ostensibly that would give him permission in order to give um, the right to give uh, psak halacha. So um, I just want to move this over here. Actually, let me take this off the screen for a couple of minutes. Off screen, sure. Draw back. Okay. And that was outlawed. Why were they outlawed? They outlawed it because they wanted to prevent the promulgation, the teaching, the spreading of Torah. Now, we know the time of Hanukkah, which is, which is uh, another time period we won't discuss, have to discuss um, at some point. Um, that one of the things they did was wanted to stop learning Torah. This is not the only time in history. This is how it happens multiple times in history where Jews are told you can't teach Torah, you can't learn Torah. But this isn't about learning. This is about passing along the ability to be a Hama teacher. Along comes a, a Yehuda ben Baba, and he says, you know what? This is happening right after the Bar Kokhba revolution, by the way, um, and the downfall of Betar. And he says, you know what? No. I need to follow the footsteps of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai put his life on the line, literally, because Vespasian could have just killed him right on the spot, to save Judaism. I need to save Smicha. And in order to do that, he gathered together five scholars. And these scholars, by the way, I still owe you an explanation. How is it possible that the Jews that were sent into slavery in the diaspora was a good thing? We're going to get to that. Um but right now, let's, we're, we're focusing for just a couple minutes on Yudhima Baba. He takes it upon himself to, to give smicha to five Torah scholars. As he's about to do this, as he's having this final meeting with them and give them smicha, whether a Jew snitched on him or the Romans had good uh, spies, it became known that the man had conferred smicha on all these people. They came, so the government, the the the, the, the soldiers came after Rabbi Yudha ben Baba and the and the students who were conferred with smicha. <clears throat> they caught him. They caught Rabbi Yudha ben Baba and they executed him. The others got away. They ran for their lives, literally ran for their lives, and they exited the country actually. And by doing so, they ended up in different places and planted seeds in 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 the diaspora for future yeshiva, which we'll come to. But amazingly, um, he gets killed just before, right after he has conferred the smicha, allows smicha to continue, and does this in order, again, to save the, the continuity of Torah. Now, how does that affect us today? Besides the fact that we have smicha still today, and besides the fact that we still are putting Torah still on the map, of course, I'll tell you an interesting, I'll show you an interesting thing that some of you may or may not be familiar with. This is an, a map of the area near Katamon. The two streets I highlighted. One is over here, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, and the other one's over here is called Ben Baba. That's who he is. So when you go on a bus and you hear uh, ba Ben Baba, that's who he was. So when you walk through their, their books, and you don't need me for this, they're books that have the names of the streets in Yerushalayim and the history behind each one. Many of the, the street signs have a little bio on some people, which we know in, in Yerushalayim, the blue signs, 
on the blue street, uh, street signs and the white ones also sometimes. But understand that when you're going through the area, um, you're going through the time of Yochem ben Zakai and Ben Baba. What's really cool in Yushalayim is some of you already know, the streets in, neighbor, in various neighborhoods are have a theme. So that in the area of uh, Rechavia, you have the, the uh, sages, many of the sages from the time of the Middle Ages of, in Spain, uh, other areas you have um, where it's the names of the streets, for example, that all voted for the partition plan from the UN um, in near the area that he flets it in Yushalayim. So it's pretty cool the way they, they set it up. I'll tell you a fast story. Kind of, I think it's kind of funny. Um, when I was learning in Shalavim hundred and so years ago, um, I I had, was a guest in the house of a friend or whatever, somebody I knew who was a little bit older, quite a bit, a number of years older than me, he's already married. And uh, he lived in, he was one, he was the first resident of the street in Gilo, the street he lived on, because Gilo was still relatively new, it was in the, in the mid 70s. And he called the area to ask and said, look, I'm the first, we're the first family on the street. Want to know if the street could be named after me? So they said like this, we have a policy in Yerushalayim, we only name people, streets after people who have passed away. If you want to accommodate us, then we will be happy to name the street after you. But we think that we prefer, you'd prefer not having the street named after you. In the old city, by the way, there's a law that it has to be only named for people who've, who've been gone for, I think, like 2,000 years or something like that. I don't remember the exact number. In any case, <laughs> I want to go back. I mentioned, I mentioned Rabbi Akiva. Uh, I've mentioned Ben Baba. I've mentioned this whole time. It's a very tumultuous time uh, uh, in our history. And because it leads to um, the establishment of furthering, believe it or not, furthering of Torah, and furthering of Jewish history, spreading around, spreading out, I want to still spend a few more minutes on this time period. Um, going back once again to the 9th of Av, 133 of the Common Era, the fall of Betar, and talk about uh, Rabbi Akiva. Remember I said that Rabbi Akiva believed that Bar Kochva was Mashiach. That he applied him to the Pasuk, Darach Kochav Miyak. Um, one of the results, I said, was that they, after executing many Jews, they also then took a lot of slaves and sent them into Rome and to other places as well. There was a problem. The Jews, to this very day, were uh, akshanim. They were very stubborn. And they very much still felt that they wanted to keep to their traditions, kosher, Shabbat. So they wouldn't eat. They would eat the things that they felt were kosher. And things that were being given to them to eat, they wouldn't eat. And I'm not talking every single Jew, and I'm not trying to make art school Judaism out of this, that everyone was religious in the Holocaust when they died. Okay, I have a little negative feelings for art school when it comes to Jewish history. Um, but it, but there were a lot of Jews. There were thousands of thousands of Jews that were exiled. And keep in mind, the Jews who were of the time of, of the Beit HaMikdash and post-Beit HaMikdash, for the most part, were religious. Um, and but not complete, not all of them. And they wanted to maintain Shabbat. They wanted to maintain Kashrut. And what was happening was, especially when it came to food, that they were not eating, they were getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And the the, uh, the Roman governor was saying, look, this isn't a good deal because we we enslaved these people to work. And if they're going to be all weak, they're not going to be working. <laughs> Remember the job there, their goal wasn't to kill them all like in the Holocaust. Their goal was to use them for cheap, for free labor. They made a decision. The decision was to allow them to have their food and allow them to also have a day off, to have Shabbat, to make them make their investment better. As a result, they end up, not only after the time period that they are slaves and they have children, it ends up that they're able to, to um, these are the seeds that are planted in the diaspora, not yet the United States, because it's another 1500 years, till there's a, more than that, till there's a, 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 a United States, um, but in other parts of, the, of this area of the world. Um, and this investment that the Romans saw as free labor ends up being positive thing for us eventually in getting Torah and Judaism spread beyond the four walls of, of Israel. Um, but you still had uh, this guy, Hadrian, who was not a very nice man. And uh, 
he felt that Vespasian had erred terribly by allowing Yochanan ben Zakkai to establish Yavne as a replacement for Jerusalem. Uh, and he came out with all these anti-Jewish laws. Put a parenthesis here for a moment, and I'm sure all of you have heard of, at least not necessarily know, but you've heard of the Nuremberg Laws. You've heard of other laws in other countries over the centuries that have been against the Jews and various edicts. Again, what we say in the Haggadah is so true. In every generation, they stand up, they try to destroy us. And Hashem saves us in their hands. It's just a different country, different name of a leader, but it's the same goal, anti-Jewish laws, whether it's the, you can't be, you know, in a government, you can't have a business, you can't have a bank account, you can't marry a non-Jew, which is a good one, the Nuremberg laws, or um, basically whatever Hadrian put into his anti-Jewish laws. So the 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 atmosphere for the Jews is is like this. It's going up and down. It's gonna. It's some days it's good, some days bad. Depends who's in charge, who's running the country. But after this point, when Bar Kochva and the and Beitar fall in one thirty six, let's put it in perspective. Until nineteen forty eight, that's eighteen hundred plus years. There's no any area in our country that is now known as Israel that had Jewish sovereignty. Back then, we had sovereignty over Beitar. That was it. That was our little hole, our little, our little corner. But since then, until 1948, no sovereignty. Whether we were under the Mamluks or the, the Turks, the, the British, the, the whoever we were under, we were under somebody else's sovereignty. Right now, we're under the sovereignty of the United States, I guess. Just a joke. Um, but it is important to understand that before, while we had the Beit Dashi, obviously we were still in the Roman rule, but we had some level of sovereignty. And but way before that, of course. But then we went this almost 2,000 years and we're still in it. Until, uh, well, forget about the Galut. I'm talking about the we until 1,800 years, but we didn't have Jewish sovereignty. Um, after the fall of Beitar, um, we still have many Gedolim, very great sages that are still alive. Among them is Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, one of the re we're going to learn about next week. We'll brief bio on him five minutes, but how does it connect to something that we do today? I'm not talking about B'nai Akiva, although it's named after Rabbi Akiva. Um, there's something that we do twice a year, uh, twice a year, that has to do with Rabbi Akiva. And uh, it's important to learn about him, and then we'll move on from that time period. Okay, uh, wish everyone a good afternoon or good evening. And uh, thank you for joining us.